Hey y'all, I'm DJ, and this is Modem Monday. This episode, we're going to talk about haze compatibility, but not the normal kind that everyone typically thinks about. In the more popular sense, the term haze compatible refers to a device which implements a passable clone or licensed version of the AT command set and which uses the famous escape sequence. That's not what we're here to talk about today. I'm going to talk about a wholly different kind of haze compatibility. That would be the Micromodem 2, its enhanced re-release, and a few clones that I know of. The Micromodem didn't use the AT command set, and yet there are compatible modems that use the same software to control them. The first Micromodem 2 was designed in 1978. You'll notice right away that this thing looks weird by today's standards. Half of this thing lives inside the computer, and the other half lives on the desk outside the computer. This was the telephone interface, known as the microcoupler. All the modem bits are on the card, and all the telephone bits are in the box. On the board, the most attention-getting items are the big orange filters that we saw in the HP85 video. See the link on screen if you haven't seen that episode yet. As per viewer Doro20 and Dale Hetherington, it's been confirmed that these are the, quote, active filter for low-speed modem applications series 207C300 transmit modules, series 207C400 receive modules, or at least as it's referred to in the Sprague Engineering Bulletin from 1976. Hayes improved upon the Micromodem 2 with the Micromodem 2E with this board from 1983. The main improvements, aside from the obvious single device construction, is that it has a speaker to monitor progress and can also generate touch tones for DTMF dialing. But this wasn't the first one to do touch tone. In 1982, Solid State Music, or SSM as they were more commonly known by then, produced their SSM Apple modem card. This is a Micromodem 2 compatible board, but it includes a DTMF generator and it has call progress monitoring capability. Note, there is no speaker on this board. It sends one bit digital audio to the software, and if the software is so equipped, it can reproduce that audio by clicking the Apple II speaker to match. The internal firmware does this automatically. The programming for DTMF and the speaker control are entirely different than that for the Micromodem 2E, simply because of the fact that this came out before the Micromodem 2E. Other than that, any software that works with an original Micromodem 2 will work fine with an SSM Apple modem card. At this point, all three of the modems that I've shown you have very similar manual firmware interfaces. That is to say, if you activate the card, such as IN pound 2, and press Control A to get the modem's attention, it gives you a one-liner prompt for you to press another character. Both the micromodems say the same thing, and the SSM says things a little bit differently. Next, we're going to look at the Zoom Modem 2E. This one is a clone of the Micromodem 2E in that it has a speaker and touchtone dialing capability. It is enhanced slightly in that it has two firmwares available. The first is the typical Micromodem 2 firmware like we've already seen, and it says Zoom Modem for its prompt. Or, if we just move this jumper, invoking the firmware takes us to a menu. The last one we'll look at today is the Multitech Multimodem 2E. Unfortunately, I won't be able to demonstrate this one because its phone interface is unhappy, and I forgot about it until the last minute for this video, so I won't have the time to diagnose and repair it. But it does respond to the firmware, and instead of one-liners, it gives a menu of commands. Pretty neat. This one, of course, also has a speaker and touchtone dialing. All five of these modems are practically identical in their circuits, and I say practically because even though they're not each a one-to-one -one clone of each other, they remain compatible through a set of registers which control the majority of the modem's functions. For example, all the instructions to configure the data bits, parity, stop bits, baud rate, off-hook status, answer originate mode, all of that are all still identical between all five of these modems. If we look at the original schematic for the original Micromodem 2, as seen here from Dale's hand-drawn schematic for what was then known as the Apple modem, we can see why there's really only so many ways that we can skin this cat. If we concentrate on the data bus, we can see that all of it's gated by the LS245 bus transceiver here, as we'd expect. The things that can talk on the bus are the 2708 ROM, the 6850 ACIA, and the Q1 transistor that lights up the ring indicator register. The only things that can receive data from the bus are the 6850 ACIA and the 74174 hex D-type flip-flop, which is actually physically what the programming manual refers to as Control Register 2, or CR2. CR1 is the 6850, and CR2 is this 174 chip. There are really just a few ways that you could have done this. All five modems have FSK modem ICs installed, 
and in the case of the original unit, it's a Motorola MC14412, and in all the others, it's a Texas Instruments TMS99532A. These chips are roughly equivalent, but are not pin compatible. So again, not possible for these to be a one-to-one -one clone of the original, per se. But we're here to talk about their compatibility, so let's do that. As we saw earlier, the firmware control is identical between each, but with some nuances. But anyone who knows how to use the Hayes firmware can use the Multitech firmware as well. The attention key for the modem is Control A unless you change it, so much the same way as a normal Hayes AT command set uses AT to get the modem's attention, here you press Control A to get the modem's attention and then another key to perform a function. But that's just the manual firmware. You can program BASIC to use the same firmware commands and very similar to how you manually control it. But by using the data register, status CR1 register, and the ring indicator CR2 register, you can control every aspect of the modem at the hardware level, bypassing the firmware routines. This is the interface that most programs actually used. This level of hardware direct access is a bit more hardcore. For example, if you need to pulse dial with the hardware register, you need loops to pulse the switch hook bit to dial each number. Now here's a basic program that I wrote to show how these modems are compatible with each other at the hardware level. This program will wait for a ring, answer the phone, wait for a carrier detection, and then send text to the caller, and then hang up. The whole program repeats once for each slot to demonstrate each modem. So let's take a quick look at the code. Here we start a slot counter, increment it, and set up some variables depending on what it is for this iteration. We then reset the modem and initialize it, and we start waiting for a call. We pull the ring indicator in a loop to see if it's active, and if it is, we pick up the phone, turn on the transmitter, and select an answer carrier. Next, we start a loop to check for carrier detection. If that loop times out, we report no carrier and start over. Otherwise, we report connect and start sending data to the end user via a subroutine. After sending more data, we pause and disconnect and restart the program. From here, we also see the transmission subroutine where we begin working with one character at a time from the string and check if the modem is ready to transmit data. If it is ready to transmit, we do. Otherwise, we check again. Then we increment the string position counter, B, and go back to check for more characters that need to be sent. At the end of each string, we also send a carriage return and a line feed before returning from the subroutine. This is awfully complicated because we're directly interfacing with the hardware. I could have done this in machine language, but more people seem to understand BASIC, so that's what I used. You may be wondering, though, why we had to go through all that. Simply put, the modem can only work on one character at a time in each direction. We have to pull it so that we don't overrun the transmitter, and also so that we don't lose any incoming characters. Let's run the test program. First, I'll connect the phone line to the original micro modem, and we'll run the program. Now that that's disconnected, we can see that the program is already ready to take a call on the SSM, so I'll move the cable and we'll repeat this. There you go, the SSM behaved identically, just as we expected. Next, I'll move the cable to the Micromodem 2E, whose phone cord dongle is just hanging off the side of the machine here. And what do you know, the Micromodem 2E is 100% Micromodem 2 compatible as well. Next we'll test the zoom, so let me get that cable moved.
all done. Sadly, we couldn't use the multi-modem because of its issue, but the other four modems all ran the exact same code controlling them, interacting directly with the ACIA and the modem control registers and the status register, bypassing all of the firmware. That's the kind of haze compatible that most people never think of, but it's true. They're completely compatible with each other, at least in the original specification. I didn't demonstrate DTMF for speaker capabilities, but the original micro modem didn't have either of those, and the Micromodem 2E, Zoom Modem 2E, and presumably the Multitech Multimodem 2E all implement it the same way. The SSM does things very differently because it predated the Micromodem 2E setting a standard for that. Now you know that a modem doesn't necessarily need an NAT command set to be considered Haze compatible. Compatibility with the Micromodem 2 was a thing also. Does anyone know if there were clones of the Micromodem 100, which was the version of the modem for the S100 bus computers like the Altair and the MSI? If so, please let me know down in the comments below. Be sure to click subscribe to get notified of my latest videos and hit the like button if you enjoyed this. Share this with your friends if you think they'd enjoy it too, and if you can, please consider supporting my efforts on Patreon with the link in the description below. Also, don't forget to check out my Facebook page. Until next time, I'll see ya.